Hello, I'm Donald Leggett and welcome to Share Views, brought to you by London South East. Our guest today is Alistair Smith, Chief Executive of Avacta Group, an aim-listed preclinical biotech which is creating Aphemers, its own disruptive alternative to current antibody technologies. Uh, welcome, Morning. welcome Alistair. Morning. Um, so Avacta is a preclinical uh, biotech company listed on AIM. Beyond that, how would you summarise the business? Uh, yeah, exactly. A preclinical biotech, uh, building a business, as you said, around our Aphema technology, which is entirely proprietary to us, a disruptive technology, as you said, which can be used to, uh, instead of, to replace antibodies in a range of uh, drug development applications and in diagnostics and, and, and research. So the uh, Avacta as a company has two business units, one that's focused on the drug development using our novel platform technology, uh, with a real focus on immuno-oncology, which is a, a very hot area of, uh, of cancer therapy at the moment, we can talk about perhaps later, uh, and the second business unit working to uh, generate revenues around the diagnostic and research applications of the Aphema technology. We're structured as two, uh, two sites, one in Cambridge, where the focus is therapeutics, and one in, in Yorkshire, in Weatherby, uh, where the focus is around that revenue-generating diagnostics business. So a UK-based uh, uh, biotech company? UK-based. Uh, we do have uh, sales business development representation in the US, in North America, which is clearly our, our biggest market. Uh, so we have individuals on the West Coast and the East Coast uh, in the US whose role is entirely around business development across those two business units. So uh, antibody technologies as they currently operate, why are they so ineffective? Uh, I think ineffective is the wrong word. Okay. Uh, and we certainly, uh, we, we don't, uh, from a business development perspective, go out and say that Aphemers are going to knock antibodies out of the, the marketplace. So antibodies are a very effective technology where they work. But there are limitations. Uh, there are what are the limitations? Yeah, so, what yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, the, forgive the, me. What, what no, are the limitations? The, the limitations are around uh, size are around the complexity of an antibody molecule which makes them difficult to adapt for different applications, uh, which makes them more expensive to manufacture, and particularly when you want to build more effective, more complicated structures with them, perhaps to hit two drug targets at once, that becomes then a very difficult sort of molecule to, to build because these are big complex um, uh, proteins. Whereas an aphema is small, very simple, uh, very robust, you can build these more complex structures and what's really important is you can still manufacture the product. I mean that's key, there's no point in making an interesting research uh, molecule that you can't commercialise. Uh, so, so there are real technical benefits around Aphemers but also real commercial benefits around the IP. So a lot of the, uh, the life science space, particularly therapeutics, the, uh, the therapeutic applications are controlled around the antibody IP. And Aphema is not an, uh, an antibody, so you can circumnavigate some of the existing IP, giving you a real commercial advantage with companies who want to uh, you know, enter new areas where the antibody IP is very solid. You've been around quite a few years now. So uh, what about are you in the journey? You know, how far along the road to creating these proprietary aphemers have you, have you got? That's an interesting question. And just a bit of prehistory, Avacta originally was not focused around aphemers. So there was a real uh, change of strategy for Avacta Group uh, back around 2012, 2013, when we acquired the aphema IP. And, and then, or very shortly after that, it was really clear that we had a super exciting technology. Uh, and so it was very difficult to justify investing in the historical part of Avacta compared to the opportunity going forward. So forwards. did you really just come, along, come across it uh, uh, and, and I, thought, I came, crikey, that's brilliant. I came across it and uh, obviously, fortunately, had the ability, the experience to understand what the potential of that technology was. And we bought it for paper uh, back in 2012. Uh, and since then, the focus has entirely shifted to developing the, the Aphema technology. So you, I think it's sensible to look at Avacta as a four or five year old company from 2012 when we became uh, focused on Aphemers. So in, in that journey, your question, uh, we are now at a point on the reagents and diagnostic side generating revenue, getting commercial traction. The technology absolutely works. There are hundreds of examples. So you know, we, we now have the challenge of building revenue to make a profitable business unit on that side. On the therapeutic side, we started that slightly later, around 2015. 
Uh, and there it is uh, absolutely critical to build the data packs that will generate license deals around particular assets or the platform in general. And we are well into that, but still plenty to, to do over the next 12 months or so to deliver some big commercial deals. To what extent do you feel you've uh, started to de-risk the business then, you know, since 2014, 2015, or 2012 when you, you bought the IP? Uh, hugely. So the, 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 when we bought the IP, we bought patents. The, there was no operational activity. There were no aphemers. It was a patent. It was uh, an idea. So, uh, yes, although it had been reduced to practice by the academic who, who developed the, the, the concept. So, uh, and, and now we are in a position where, as I said, from a non-therapeutic applications perspective, we have a huge amount of, of data showing aphemers working in many different applications. We are building revenue. We have can't talk about a lot of the detail now, but we have a lot in the pipeline in terms of big partners evaluating the technology to ultimately take a license deal to develop products and produce that royalty stream, which is what we're after. And you've, just, you've just appointed a new senior chairman. That must be, go some way to uh, giving you credibility in the marketplace and, and helping cement your position. And with particular relevance to the therapeutic uh, development side of the business. So yeah, so yeah Elliot Forster uh, joined us a few weeks ago. He was um, head of Pfizer globally outside North America. Uh, af after that, worked in a number of biotechs and most recently was the chief executive of Immunicor that many of your listeners will, uh, will know about. That's one of, one of the most successful UK, private UK biotechs uh, in recent times. So he comes with a huge amount of uh, commercial as well as scientific experience so what do you how expect to develop him? drugs into the clinic. Do you expect him to open doors? Do you expect him to understand uh, uh, the process you need to go through? What's he going to be uh, giving all, by way of advice? All of those things. My, my view and I, the general view of what the board and the chairman and the board should provide to the company for its shareholders uh, is strong input into the strategy and that will be commercial input as well as technical input um, and also uh, the, the corporate governance that, that, that's necessary. But he will contribute right across the board, the commercials, the network, the door opening, mm -hmm. as well as have his own uh, view and input into the technical strategic decisions that we take about which targets to work on, for example. Agreed. Uh, the big, big question always for, uh, for uh, uh, drugs companies is what's the potential market uh, for your technologies and what kind of momentum are you building behind that technology? Yeah. I suppose it, it, one has to be careful not to start getting hyperbolic because what we have is we have a platform technology, which means we are not a single asset drug company. There isn't one drug that we are developing. We have the ability to produce a, 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 you know, a very large pipeline of different aphemers because we have a platform to generate them from. <clears throat> so the, the potential value is genuinely enormous. Take, take the, the Ex recent... Exponential. Yes, and the, the recent acquisition of Ablinks, which is a great comparator. So Ablinks had a similar, has a similar technology, uh, further advanced in terms of being in, in the clinic, but they just got bought by Sanofi for $5 billion. And there's an example of a platform technology producing a pipeline of therapeutics. Each of those has value, and you've, of course, got the platform that can generate more. So, so the potential for the platform is is huge on the therapeutic side, genuinely huge. Mm. Uh, resource limited, of course, uh, and as we do those deals, we'll be able to do more. On the reagent side, um, you know, that will be a profitable business in a few years' time, uh, and then that will be a financially valued business unit, and a really good comparator, a company I like, uh, many of your viewers will know, is Bioventix. So that is a business that has a similar business model, licensing antibodies in this case into the diagnostic space. You know, they have a, 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 a relatively small revenue stream, a market cap of 150 million pounds roughly, if I remember correctly. So there's, there's, there's significant value in the research side and huge value in the therapeutic side, mm -hmm. but some good downside risk protection through the revenue generating part of the business. Great, all sounds very encouraging. Yeah, I mean, we're very excited. Um, Nice to get the placing out of the way this summer. I'm sure you've got a question about that. Yeah, coming uh, up. But the future is looking uh, very, very interesting for a vector. Yep.
um, how far away are you from a first in man clinical trials? And, and do you need to, you know, having raised money, yeah. and you've raised uh, 11.6 million in August, will you need to raise more from shareholders? Yeah, so we, we, we've got sufficient funds for the foreseeable, so that, that's great. Um, the, uh, we've talked publicly many times about the target of clinical trials in 2020, that remains the case. Uh, and, and that, as I'm sure you know, is a huge value inflection point for the company. It is a big de-risking point to get the safety and tolerability data for the platform per se, which allows us to do bigger deals than we've done in the past and may be able to do before we get into the clinic. Uh, so we will remain on target for 2020 human data uh, and we've got the funds to, to get there. Obviously, if we want to expand that clinical pipeline, then further resource will be required, but that's not in the plan at the moment. You were talking about being able to do materially significant deals before you get to the stage of clinical trials. Yeah. Um, is, that still, is that still the case? Absolutely. So if you'd asked me that question two years ago, mm -hmm. I would have said, uh, no, I think we've got to be in the clinic. We've got a new technology. People are going to be concerned about its safety, etc. Um, and, and we need to be in the clinic before we can do a significant licensing deal. Uh, in, in, the, in the intervening two years, as we've been working very hard in terms of business development, talking to many large pharmaceutical companies, I'm very confident that we can do a preclinical license, licensing deal with meaningful upfronts and, and, and milestone payments. Uh, some pharma are more conservative, others have a greater appetite for risk and opportunity. So, so now I would absolutely say that's, that's doable in the next 18 months. And when will we start hearing about these deals coming through? So again, what we've said publicly, I mean I can't give any specific timescale obviously, but what we've said publicly uh, it is that we expect to be reporting on commercial deals, licensed deals from the reagents and diagnostics part of the business. We have many evaluations going on in the back half of this year and onwards, so, so not, not far away. Uh, and on the therapeutic side, sometime in the next 12 months, as we are in that preclinical phase. Very interesting. Um, and this all ties in, you've just raised 11.6 million. Uh, who did you raise it from? What did you raise it for? And how are you going to manage your cash burn going forward? It's yes. always the cash burn question. Sure. And, uh, uh, and we have always been very good at managing cash burn. I think it's an important point to get across. So we have always stuck to our budget. We have always reported cash burn effectively at the level the market expects. So, so that's out in the market, you know, what we expect to, to, to burn over the next 12, 24 months. Uh, so we raised the money from existing shareholders uh, and some new shareholders. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that'll be on our website by now. So there's a new shareholder in, uh, in Hong Kong. It's very interesting. Uh, and China, I think, is an area where there is significant risk appetite from an investment and a commercial perspective, so I'm out there in, in 10 days' time, actually. Um, you know, it's an area we need to put more effort into. And so you've had, you have a bundle of fairly major institutional shareholders. How That's supportive right. are they of you? Uh, very much so. Um, so I'm not aware, as far as my interaction with them goes, of, of any of them not being supportive. Well, they're putting money into you, so uh, exactly. that's always a good yeah. sign. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. But getting new shareholders in is also important, and as I said, we have done that as well uh, in, in, this, uh, in this placing. Uh, and I think your question around cash burn, I've probably probably covered. It's um, you know we. You, have seem, some a, you seem a very organised company in the way that you, you go about doing business. I certainly you, like to think so. You put your milestones out there. You you tend to hit them, and which presumably gives institutions faith that you will do so in the future. Uh, yes, we have been very good, not perfect, but very good at hitting our milestones uh, that we've set out. We I was speaking to someone yesterday who said we were uh, unusually honest in our. Um, in the amount of information we put out about what our milestones are, what we intend to, uh, for example, exactly how we intend to spend the money is there for people to see in quite some detail. Um, how else would you do it? My, my view is you've got to, if you're going to raise money, you've got to tell people exactly what you're going to spend that on. Uh, and if there can always be changes in strategy, of course, and then you explain that to people and they accept it. But you've got to be pretty frank, I think, about what you're going to do with shareholders' money. Indeed. And in terms of profitability and break-even, you were saying that's not quite the way you should think about a biotech business. So explain to us how we should think in terms of yep. you know, you know, some yeah, sort of yeah, you know, yeah, so that, that certain stage that you're going to get to as a business. Break-even profitability, I think you have to think about the two sides of our business separately. So the, the revenue-generating business around 
licensing aphemers into the diagnostics and research, research space. We should think about that in terms of profitability and our objective has been to get that profitable as soon as possible. I think that's probably a two to three year time scale, uh, broadly speaking. So um, 2020, 2021? Uh, exactly. Uh, coincidentally, around the same time that we're in the clinic with the first therapeutic aphemers, which is an interesting time point. Um, so th so th that business, we should absolutely start to think now about profitability. Uh, on the biotech side, I think it's, it, it's, not, it's not correct to think about is Avacta ultimately in 10 years time going to be selling drugs to doctors and getting revenue and uh, the, the business model in a biotech business is all around licensing. Now there may be a point, there should be a point indeed, when we, when we are doing license deals with sufficiently large upfronts, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million upfronts, that will self-fund our R&D. Now that I would say will be happening when we're in the clinic. At the moment, preclinically, we should be able to get a few million dollars up front with milestone development milestone payments. When you're in the clinic and you've de-risked the platform, you can stick a naught onto all of those numbers. You can see that in the, in the mm. deals that are done. Um, so that, that's the way to think about it. Licensing deals, upfront, self-funding R&D, rather than calling it a profitable Great. Uh, business in that sense. Okay, and as we come to the end of the interview, if I could ask you to summarize the investment case, Give me you know, your best minute, your elevator pitch, I suppose, okay. in terms of uh, uh, if, if you want some, you're interested in retail uh, investors, you yeah. want to get that free float going, yeah. you want to get people buying and selling your shares. Absolutely. How would you, how would you pitch it to them? Yeah, so we, we've, got a, we've got a very exciting disruptive technology, which we absolutely know works. So we are well beyond the stage of demonstrating the technology works. I think that's important to get across to people because clearly if you don't understand the science, which most people don't, you, you want to know does the damn thing work. It works. So, so, so now what you have to think about is the huge potential and potential for share price increase driven by commercial and clinical success on the therapeutic side. And we go back to that example of uh, Ablinks. Same, similar technology, bought out for five billion this year by Sanofi. There is huge potential on the therapeutic side, but of course there is risk, and people understand that in biotech there is a reasonable amount of risk. So part of my uh, investor pitch, if you like, would be to say, look, there's a huge excitement and value potential on the therapeutics, but we have real downside uh, 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 risk reduction by building a revenue-generating business which can easily be worth multiples of what the current market cap is with no regulatory hurdles, very little risk because the technology works. It's about commercial exploitation. So I think that, that's the pit. There's real excitement over the next couple of years as we enter the clinic, the sort of valuation uplift you get when you're in a clinic and very little downside risk because of the revenue generation. Fantastic. A very interesting business. Uh, that's it for now. Thanks to uh, Alistair Smith, CEO of Avacta Group our very own British Biotech for joining us in the studio. And if you found this interview useful, please subscribe for more by Googling London Southeast YouTube. Thank you.